Welcome everybody to uh, the MGH Brain PBM round. Uh, my name is Paolo Cassano. Today is April 7, 2023. Uh, it is uh, uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Damir uh, Nitsamuti Dinov, um, who is uh, from uh, Baylor Scott and White Health, uh, and he's the director of the Dementia Prog Program at Temple, Texas. Uh, uh, Damir, uh, please uh, take it away. Hello, it's welcome to uh, meet you, everybody. So, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, series. So, I uh, wanted to uh, say a special thank you for organizers of these uh, meetings. And uh, David and Paul, uh, thank you so very much for our uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, have this talk today. I also wanted to uh, very quickly uh, say hi to Marvin Berman, who is actually also on this um, uh, series and uh, uh, could uh, join us today. So he's a great collaborator and we actually did great uh, projects together. So this is something uh, we'll also will uh, be associated and linked to his work and uh, his contribution to this project. Hi, Marvin. So um, basically, uh, if if we already so I can uh, start sharing screen. So very quickly, just a few words about myself. So I'm uh, uh, with Bell Scott and White uh, Health at uh, Central Texas. So we're located in Temple, Texas, and um, I am director of dementia program here at Bell Scott and White. Uh, have affiliation with the neurosurgery department and also associate director of a neuro-oncology team um, on the research side. So uh, it's not directly linked to uh, today's project, today's talk, but uh, we mostly will be focusing on dementia. So uh, let me uh, start sharing screen. So this is uh, our screen. Do you see screen? Clearly, we do. Uh, however, it's not presenter mode. Now it is. Yes, yes. So uh, basically, today's talk is going to be focused, and I wanted to also tell you that I'm sharing screen, so I have two screens. So my head probably would be tilted a little bit. So just uh, letting you know, I'm uh, watching the screen here. So today's talk will be focused on the uh, photobiomodulation treatment of dementia. And specifically, we will be focused on the uh, near infrared light um, uh, technology, uh, uh, which actually specifically use 1072 nanometer wavelength. So this is an interesting and unique flavor um, probably to your series because uh, majority of the work we see published these days is uh, focus on a range of uh, 800 uh, nanometer wavelength of uh, uh, near infrared light. And the uh, majority of studies also done in this uh, particular wavelength. And that's what uh, uniqueness of this project lies, uh, where actually it's uh, in that particular 1072 nanometer uh, wavelength. So this is something I wanted to uh, uh, bring up uh, right up front. Also uh, a few words about um, um, points that today's talk will be focused on dementia. Of course, dementia is a very cumulative word uh, which are associated with many different pathologies and uh, different diseases. That's also uniqueness of today's talk because it's not specifically focused on particular disease state. It will be covered uh, dementia of different type of disease and pathologies behind, which will be helpful for un understanding how this technology can be beneficial in treatment or management of uh, such conditions uh, which lead to dementia. So let me start the presentation. I will very quickly go over the background and introduction. Uh, most of us in this field and area uh, on this talk probably know uh, all uh, disease associated with dementia and background, but it will help, uh, it will help to understand better uh, what we're talking about specifically, uh, which will be linked to uh, 1072 nanometer wavelength as well. So this background introduction to dementia is a broad number of syndromes, right? Brain diseases, which often characterized by long and gradual decrease ability of thinking, remembering, cognitive function. So that's why uh, causes of dementia also can be different depending on uh, different pathology and disease. It can be due to head injuries or brain tumors, infection, hydrocephalus, hormone disorders, metabolic disorders, 
hypoxia. In few words, uh, the cause of dementia can be divided now, untreatable and treatable. So the irreversible, we call it irreversible because it can be uh, associated with morphological changes in the brain and cause some pathology and disease, which may not be changed or reversible at some point of time. So like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewis body dementia, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, Peak's disease, or uh, Cranesville Jacob disease. Uh, we consider them to be uh, irreversible at some point of time when we have enough accumulation of uh, bad toxic uh, proteins in, in the system and the brain. So dementia risk factors can be age, family history of disease, uh, the Down, sy Down syndrome, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia risk factors include not limited to the uh, alcohol abuse, cardiovascular diseases, depression, diabetes, smoking, sleep apnea. So everything can contribute to the development of dementia at some point of time. So a uh, symptom of dementia rely on the cause of disease and include cognitive changes, which are and psychological changes. Cognitive changes are memory loss, difficulty communicating, performing complex tasks or problem solving, planning or organizing, motor function, confusion also contributes to the uh, uh, low quality of life and uh, uh, difficulties on the daily basis and uh, with the family communication. Psychological changes are depression, personality changes, anxiety, paranoia, and appropriate behavior, ag agitation, hallucinations, depending on severity. So if you can see Alzheimer's disease facts, uh, in people of age 65 and older, most common cause of dementia, it's uh, uh, one of the leading causes of death in the United States and actually cost a lot of money to um, United States uh, health care and uh, um, the billions of dollars cost to Medicare and Medicaid. Also, uh, Alzheimer's have increased uh, significantly in recent years and it's planned to be increased uh, many times up to, uh, I believe, 2035, uh, last reports were. So it's... Uh, it's uh, increasing in numbers and very uh, uh, devastating uh, neurodegenerative disease. So this is one of the, uh, of course, uh, diseases of uh, causing dementia. Also characterized by accumulation of amyloid plaques and tau proteins, neurofibrillary tangles, neuronal cell death, and synaptic death over time. So the ideal therapeutic tool, uh, which would we may possibly have these days for dementia treatment, uh, would address few uh, very important points. It would, uh, if it would be there, but the, we don't have real uh, treatment for dementia these days. But uh, the best case would be neuroprotection, neuroregeneration. Uh, the uh, best um, medical, you know, uh, therapeutic tool would address the prevent toxic protein accumulation and improve production and regulation of neurotransmitters. So, which would be beneficial to treat and cure and slow down the progression of neurodegenerative diseases. All existing non-surgical treatments address an uh, end result of pathology, loss of neurotransmitters. Uh, treatment focus on reducing loss of acetylalanine doesn't stop disease progression, which we all know, and reducing the deposits of uh, toxic um, beta protein seeded plaques uh, beneficial for Alzheimer's disease related pathology. So today uh, I would like to break the light spectrum a little bit, so to bring up a little little different aspects and the wavelength of the light. So if you can see. Uh, with the high frequency, the shorter wavelength actually equals to more energy. So uh, the longer, a longer wave actually like uh, infrared light that carry a lot of energy with it. So basically, which corresponds or correlates to the heat of local and uh, uh, tissue uh, when it uh, um, eliminates on, on, the, on the tissue. And uh, uh, what's interesting about in particular red and infrared A uh, spectrum, it's uh, relatively low on the red and infrared light spectrum, and at the same time, it doesn't carry um, as much of uh, energy with it, so it doesn't heat the uh, tissues uh, at, at the same time. So our specific goal and focus is on 1072 nanometers, so basically we um, chose to uh, stay within this spectrum to bring some uniqueness to the uh, field of uh, photobiomodulation and uh, biomedical uh, 
uh, field uh, in this area. So uh, this is uh, a very short ch chart uh, which represents the um, the uh, light penetration to the cortex. Of course, it's a completely totally, uh, different area of expertise where people do different type of research on the cadavers and uh, they try to uh, yeah, measure the light, how deep it penetrates. So this is not like the, one of the uh, latest updates on, on, on penetration. But if you can see the 1072 nanometer lies somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 plus uh, percent of penetration to the cortex so and that was measured uh, so unfortunately I, I i have to apologize so when it was slight preparation i didn't do proper uh the correspondence or uh, uh, credits to the uh, uh pu publisher so uh but that's that's uh, uh so basically a very quick overview how this uh links and and actually to the field and how this may play a role a uh, beneficial role for a uh, photobiomodulation so the infrared light penetration uh also actually was measured compared to all layers uh, uh and uh and separately to the loss of skin a loss during bone penetration or dura and C CSF penetration, if you can see, uh, the loss on the skin is uh, the highest among uh, others uh, if we compare to the penetration uh, of the light through the uh, soft tissue and the uh, structures of the um, skull. So is wavelength critical? Uh, it is critical. And uh, this presentation in particular, uh, this slide presents the pulse width and wavelength significance of the associated with 1072 nanometer, how actually this affects the percent of cell viability. So if you can see different wave uh, length uh, presented here, and the 1072, it seems to be the highest uh, 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 in response to the cell viability. So this is also why uh, this particular spectrum was chosen and uh, uh, for the uh, treatment and uh, uh, clinical trial we uh, are about to present. So how can 1072 nanometer light have such diverse effects? So uh, neuroprotection is the one uh, the powerful um, tool which actually have uh, a relevance and significant 1072 nanometer and neuroregeneration. So uh, the neuroprotection is, uh, you know, characterized as a process by which cells are protected and from damaging of environmental influences and neuroregeneration in the process referred to regrowth or repair of nervous tissue cell or cell products. So this particular slide represents the um, uh, example of how uh, infrared light in particular can be beneficial of um, UV exposure. And uh, if you can see, this is control group on the cell viability. And uh, when it was uh, UVA uh, treated and combined with infrared light, we can see some beneficial protective effects on this slide, uh, which is actually contributes to uh, overall hypothesis that can be uh, neuroprotective as well, so uh, cell protective. So effects of infrared light on neuronal cells are represented here. And if you can see in mild, moderate, and severe uh, insult and this particular model was um, uh, ischemic uh, injury to the brain insult was uh, created and if you can see um, the most beneficial effect uh, neuroprotection with the infrared light uh, would uh, be detected at a mild stage or mild injury. It actually breaks even uh, for the moderate uh, damage uh, to the brain, but uh, almost no much effect to the severe damages to the brain. So also um, it can be related to the um, accumulation and uh, you know uh, synthesis and uh, secretion of the um, uh, the uh, toxic uh, elements associated with Alzheimer's disease. And if you can see beta amyloid compared to this chart, and shame and infrared treated uh, group actually decreases the amount of the um, uh, beta amyloid in the brain. So if you can see, that's uh, also beneficial. It also relates to the toxic uh, plaque formation and decrease of number of uh, and size of uh, toxic plaques in the brain. If you can see different uh, part of the brain were evaluated and uh, in shame and infrared uh, group, we can see decrease in number and uh, specifically size also. 
of uh, uh, plex decreased so if you can see on the chart also here uh, a good representation in small uh, plex size will decrease more compared to medium and larger uh, plex so which uh, corresponds and uh, links to directly to the uh, some sort of preventative measure rather than just uh, you know uh, clearance um, uh, a hypothesis so uh, uh just showing uh, this uh, preventative and decreasing number of uh, for small plex formation would be one of the beneficial effects uh, and that was done on uh the ad uh, mice model so here uh, uh, uh how the 1072 nanometer lights express Krebs transcription factors which we know all are very supportive and helpful in the management and secretion of uh, stress protective proteins in different models and if you can see heat shock proteins the different types of them and also regulates the important proteins for learning memory and neuronal protection like CREP, EMPA, BDNF so if you can see with the ER treatment infrared light treatment in the transgenic mice we see increase in the CREP expression uh, in both cases so this is another representation of how the infrared light near infrared light can improve the behavioral functioning and behavioral um, uh, effects on the animals and this of course also done on the alzheimer's animals uh, transgenic uh, mice cd1 mice and we can see that uh, the treatment with the near infrared light actually improved the uh, behavioral performance of, of these animals so in summary, uh, infrared light is critical for treatment outcomes. Infrared light uh, improving cell viability, also reduces amyloid amylation and prevents plaque formation in animal models. And the light simulates protein involved in stress protection, learning and memory and repair, as well as behavioral performance. So this all overall uh, preclinical studies uh, just was uh, overall, um, you know, the background and introduction to get some ideas that would be very helpful and uh, maybe beneficial tool to do in, uh, in a clinical trial and start some uh, human uh, study. So that's why uh, on human uh, study, uh, we actually uh, did two, uh, two uh, treatments or two trials. So one trial uh, was a pilot study we did. It was a very short 12 cases um, um, study and also was a short in duration of a treatment. So it was just one month and I'm about to talk about this. But I just few words wanted to say about this uh, helmet unit to be used for this clinical trial. That was uh, designed in um, again uh, in collaboration and work with uh, Marin Berman uh, which is quite my foundation. So uh, develop this uh, helmet prototype device, which we use for our trials. And if you can see, uh, this particular device has 12 cranial models with the two foldable eye models. Uh, and they actually have different uh, number of uh, LED lights. So also uh, uniqueness of this particular te technology is that it doesn't use uh, laser uh, light. Uh, this one use um, infra um, infrared, near infrared uh, LED lights. So they are not visible by uh, um, naked eyes. And if it's active device, that's the beauty. And that actually corresponds probably to your next question, which I hear uh, sometimes you ask uh, during discussion section how the placebo and uh, active device are different so they look completely identical and difference would be they uh, if you can see each model has some little fence there so all fence will be activated in both placebo and active devices because it's invisible light in both cases you won't be able to see light with naked eyes which will not make any difference between active or placebo device of course everything is communicated uh, during our uh, you know, uh, enrollment process and discussion with the patient and family members so they all know uh, that um, uh, they won't be able to tell uh, which uh, group they are in so uh, uh, regarding the uh, active and placebo so and uh, that's something I wanted to also bring up uh, so also all these green lights which is number two green indicator light they are also active and on uh, in both in placebo and active device treatment so if you can see uh, this device to generate about 15 watt power 
And this is continuous light, uh, which is a physical aspect of this. I want to uh, very quickly, I also noticed you ask questions like that. I wanted to bring up. So this is continuous light. It's not um, uh, flit flittering light. Uh, it flickers not, does, it doesn't, uh, you know, um, it's a same continuous light uh, to the source. And uh, in this case, it will be transcranial uh, neuroinfrared treatment. So if you can see, it covers all uh, uh, parts of the brain and also has eye uh, models or eye pieces, which actually fall to the uh, eyeballs. And it helps also um, deliver light through the optic nerve and through the very thin uh, bone structure in orbitals um, and uh, will deliver light to the brain. So, uh, but again, this is few uh, points I want to mention. This is generates about 15 watt uh, per all models at the same time. So, and actually uh, corresponds uh, roughly to 650 uh, you know, square centimeter per treatment area. So enrollment criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria, basically we try to enroll um, uh, a big range of uh, patients. So the only criteria we were looking at, so there is no active uh, brain oncology um, going on. So we also look at exclusion criteria that said that a patient should not be epileptic and also no history of acute ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes. So, um, and uh, for the inclusion criteria, we look at 50 to 85 years old uh, in the general good health uh, uh, condition. So we uh, screened and evaluated patients to see the past six months history to see to make sure that they're in good uh, health shape. So of course, uh, other diseases, um, you know, uh, at this age, we have uh, different chronic uh, conditions and uh, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, exclude them all. So that partially was one of the contributing factors that on the second trial, which we did, we had three dropouts. So they're out of 60. And that was indication of uh, how that actually other uh, morbidities uh, can contribute to uh, you know, continuous or the stop to the trial. So they actually uh, uh, dropped out for different reasons not associated with the treatment with near infrared light. So trial one, uh, helmet study plan uh, was developed as uh, or refills a screen prior enrollment. Customized infrared light uh, was again 1072 nanometer helmet device, which I just uh, presented. And uh, the uh, patients uh, were evaluated for QEEG, a quantitative EEG, comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation every two weeks in this trial. So this trial was four weeks duration, it was just four weeks. Uh, it was every day, uh, six minutes long, uh, two sessions in the morning in in the evening. So uh, it was continuous treatment uh, uh, for four weeks. And we did evaluation in this case um, at the beginning of the uh, trial of the treatment in the midterm and in the end. So it was two weeks and four weeks time points. So again, that was pilot short study. We have just 12 cases in this case, uh, in this trial. And if you can see comprehensive overview of observed findings were focused on neuropsychological evaluation, in which we can see minimal status exam, precision, fine tuning, coordination. We evaluated short-term memory and logical memory changes. We evaluated long-term memory changes in object recognition, digit manipulation changes, times of performance and sharpness of thinking. So also quantitative EEG uh, was helpful uh, with the help of, uh, again, uh, Dr. Marvin Berman, uh, so he helped to, uh, you know, do analysis of quantitative EEG, and uh, that was helpful uh, addition to this trial as well, uh, I'm about to present. So overall improved performance of cognitive function, quick screening for dementia was done by MMSE, so that was one of the uh, also enrollment criteria we were looking for the mild to moderate uh, stages of dementia. And again, we did not separate or differentiate by uh, the disease causing the dementia. That's a little uh, flavor for this particular trial. We were looking for broad spectrum of different conditions as long as they were fit in the dementia criteria.
So MMSC score from zero to 30, if we all familiar about. Uh, so we were looking in for a mild to moderate dementia. And if you can see the average value before treatment uh, was about 21 and the lower, of course, because it's average and average after was about 24. So we actually could see the range of improvement uh, on one to six points, which was uh, up to 22% improvement on MSC scoring. So this is a clock drawing improvement uh, before and after treatment. Uh, some of the uh, shapes drawing improvements were increased up to 50% improvement based on four different tested shapes. And this is just representative of before and after how the drawing would look uh, by patients who actually were doing the um, uh, treatment uh, for four weeks uh, difference before and for. So for presentation here and the difference I presenting, uh, uh, we evaluated the difference from before treatment, uh, first neuropsychological evolution QEG before treatment and in four weeks time for a point. Uh, I don't present two week time point here, but I'm happy to uh, discuss and address any questions associated with uh, most frequently ask how often and how fast you see the improvement on such and such uh, 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 you know, neuropsychological um, readings. So I will be able to address that because we did some, uh, uh, you know, look and uh, 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 touch base with the family members to see how fast we start to see any improvements in real life situation. So memory improvements here uh, for this trial, which was again, four weeks long, uh, mal mal uh, you know, yeah, multifaceted assessments on the immediate word recall actually uh, showed us up to 60% improvement. The delayed word recall showed us 15% improvement. And the detail in you know, the logical memory was up to uh, 40%. And again, when I say up to 40%, it's one of the best representation uh, uh, in, in cohort. So, and uh, the averaging about 18.5% of improvement uh, for this short trial. In long-term memory, it was up to 100% of improvement depending on the test. So improved object recognition uh, was roughly up to 15.4% of improvement, which is not as uh, significantly higher that it would compare to other readings, averaging about 4.2% of improvement. And when I'm referring to improved object recognition, it's a Boston name reading test where we actually uh, have a list of different objects they have to recognize in given time. Digit manipulation improvements uh, relates to the uh, number cancellation test, digit spent forward and backwards, and trail making test. So this reading actually was uh, improved by up to 35% uh, for the uh, four weeks trial. Improved performance time was spent on time session during tests was noticeably shortened. So what we noticed that um, uh, patients start to perform uh, all this test and assessment time decreased significantly. And in some cases, in this case, was 33% of improvement. And uh, of course, it's averaging. Uh, it can be different uh, depending on different uh, disease pathology behind and different case and age. But uh, uh, overall improved performance time was uh, noticeable. So this is a uh, QEG readings, which uh, Dr. Berman shared with us, uh, pre-treatment QEG and post-treatment uh, QEG. If we can see delta power increase, which actually improved alertness, attention, and less anxiety. So delta coherence and uh, uh, improved attention and focus and memory also were noted. So on this uh, reading at uh, one of the representation uh, was also uh, improved the mood and sleep cycle, mental focus. They were done more efficient neural processing and executive function improvement and some faster, more efficient neural processing as well. So in summary, all these 12 clinical cases were completed and the improvement of MSC was in the range of 6.5 to 22 and half percent. Positive responders were early to mid-stage dementia 
And uh, again, uh, we uh, did not enroll uh, severe um, dementia in, in uh, this particular trial, again, because it was pilot study. And we also, uh, with, with previous animal studies, uh, where it were very evident that the uh, most beneficial effect of near infrared and photobiomodulation are noticed in uh, you know, a mild damage to the brain and uh, uh, moderate demos. So that's why uh, the early and mid-stage dementia were our preliminary focus. So the um, infrared light 1072 improves alertness, mental focus, fine motor function, mood, sleep cycles, appetite. This also not only was supported by QEG, but with the conversation with our uh, family members, because uh, every enrollment, it was uh, uh, the uh, assessment was done uh, and uh, performed with the patients, and we also collect uh, some data from the family members on, of course, uh, how they uh, uh, performed the task. It was, uh, you know, the device, by the way, um, I wanted to, in both trials, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, it was given uh, to home. So the treatment was done at home, not at the hospital. So they took it home. They actually performed it at home and uh, conducted it was by, with the help of family members. That's why support of family uh, members was uh, in, very instrumental for these two trials. I just wanted to tell, so that was the device given to home. So, and also treatment also contributes improvement of executive function. Uh, so that was noted by family members as well. Uh, regarding the sleep cycle and the uh, quality of sleep, it was noted in few cases by family members. So they were uh, better sleep, longer sleep during night. And uh, of course that affected the overall performance of uh, patients uh, after um, and during daytime. So this is trial two, a uh, few uh, data elements I wanted to share. This also was published, uh, part of this uh, the, the data was published uh, in the uh, Aging and Disease uh, publication. And uh, I wanted to uh, also just uh, quickly uh, report this um, uh, outcome of this trial as well. So that was just recently done and uh, all referrals also was screened in uh, prior enrollment. Uh, we use a very similar uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria for the second trial. So, and uh, the only difference, uh, major difference was that duration of this trial was a little longer. It was two months continuous treatment, uh, 56 consequent days. And uh, the uh, treatment regimen or uh, the protocol did, uh, didn't change. So we did twice daily, six minutes each session. And uh, um, uh, the uh, evaluation was done three times. It was before treatment at four weeks time point, which is midterm, and in the end of the trial, which was eight weeks. Overall improved performance of cognitive function. Uh, just very quickly on MMSE here. So we actually have seen a much better performance outcomes on these readings. Uh, with the uh, two months uh, treatment, and I'm presenting here only the outcome, which is uh, the last um, outcome on measures done at four uh, four uh, four months. I'm um, two months or uh, eight weeks uh, evaluation. So it will be uh, before and after um, in this trial as well. So if you can see, uh, MMSC score actually improved up to seventy five percent in this case, which was almost twice uh, better uh, than it was on a shorter uh, trial. So those are a few representations of uh, clock drawing improvements. We can see uh, in percent improvement uh, that I, there were 50, 60 percent improvement, and uh, that's noticeable in uh, a two months time uh, frame. Shapes drawing improvements also were up to 80 percent in this case, which also improved compared to a one month trial. So memory improvements were uh, also uh, overall better than it was uh, in, uh, during a short four weeks trial. Immediate word recalls up to 82%, delayed word recall up to 64%, up to 52 representation were done detailed logical memory and long-term memory were up to 100% here as well. So uh, averaging range here for the detailed logical memory was uh, 38, 39% to 46% uh, for subtest. So that was also uh, better than it was for shorter uh, period of time treatment. 
improved object recognition also was noticeably better uh, compared to the uh, shorter trial we did, and it was up to 35% overall, which is significant for some patients having dementia for many years. Digits manipulation improvements, a number cancellation tests, digits span forward and backwards and trail making tests up to 75% of improvement. Um, sorry here, I'm running low on the battery. So, um, so this one here is a trail making test improvement. Uh, and this one, um, just give me one second. Oh, oh. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> just one second. Let me connect power. No worries. Well, um, so this is um, trail making test improvements, which actually uh, have significance uh, compared to the um, the active before and after treatment comparison uh, for trail making tests and trail making tests A and B. So uh, basically, this is uh, how shorter. I guess. Uh... The power was the issue here, um, and uh, you know we're going to wait for Damir to come back. Uh, um, I don't know if uh, there is anything that wants anyone that wants to discuss or or uh, any thoughts. Meanwhile, Marvin, it seems like you're <laughs> Marvin. Uh, are these? Hi, Marvin. Hi. Happy Passover. Same to you. Are these helmets available uh, for patients or only through a study? Uh, they're they're available. They're they're available. But what we what Demir is going to get to, I think, is that there's now another device. There's a a subsequent design that I I went to based on this work. We now have a different design that is significantly easier to use at home and also less expensive. So you can, you can get in touch with me and I'll, I'll go over it with you. That's it's great. called the Neradiant. Yeah, it's called the Neradiant. Neradiant, I like the name. Me too. Yeah, Jay, it's, um, I'm really happy that Demir got to do this and uh, <laughs> the technology always bites us. So I think <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess one, one thought I had, which is, um, uh, you know, I, I'm also thinking at mechanism of action here. Um, I, I see a parallel in between uh, uh, this technology, which is, uh, uh, and Marvin, correct me if I got this wrong, uh, uh, low irradiance over large surfaces, uh, but not really specifically targeting any, um, any right. particular circuitry. And uh, uh, what we have seen uh, um, being used by uh, Catherine Hamilton and John Mitrofanik uh, for Parkinson's disease uh, also was low irradiance over large surfaces. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, years ago, almost a decade ago, Marnie, that is on the call, have used a similar paradigm in TBI patients, also right. very low irradiance over large surfaces. So it does seem to be working well for this population with uh, neurodegenerative diseases or cognitive uh, impairment yeah. um, in, in the face of uh, um, you know a very low likelihood of, of penetration um, well, we're seeing the penetration we're seeing the effect you know I mean independent of the arguments about power we're seeing the results absolutely the, the thing that struck me, that Demir might not comment on was that there was a subgroup within the cohort of people who were duly diagnosed with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Okay. Oh, I'm back. Oh, he's back. Okay. I'm back. Um, take it on then. Yeah, I apologize for this. Uh, no worries. Power is disconnected. Do you see the screen now? We do. All right, so let me do, is it full mode now, right? It is. Now, okay. now it is. 
I'm so sorry about this. Okay, so let me get to the point. So basically the time of the performance for this particular trail making test also was significantly decreased in, uh, in both observations before uh, compared to after uh, the treatment. So improved performance time was also decreased. Uh, and uh, in this case, it was, if you can see, uh, if it was about 33% for the uh, first trial, this trial actually showed us 52% of decrease in some cases, which was a, a very, very big uh, decrease compared to all three evaluations we've done uh, for each case. So if you can see on quantitative electroencephalography, we will be able to see the improved attention, mood and sleep cycle, mental focus and memory changes, and on this slide, we can see improved alertness, attention, less anxiety readings, uh, also faster, more efficient neural processing and executive function uh, indications. So for summary too, uh, we can say that uh, infrared light and near infrared light improves immediate and delayed memory performance. And also light demonstrates logical memory improvement uh, improves executive function, improves alertness, mental focus, fine motor function, mood, sleep, and appetite, and also ability to stay focused. So some uh, cerebral blood flow also actually improved. Uh, we had uh, some readings done before, and that was uh, indicative of the cerebral blood flow in wow. improvements. So I just wanted to very quickly say here and add to this particular summary that the sleep, uh, again, was noted on several occasions uh, from several families and the patients in our case, so which is very important in overall uh, patient's performance in, in this stage and dementia. So that's why uh, sleep was very important. Appetite was noted for by some family members as well. So uh, overall, the uh, health performance, uh, communication with the family members improved. Quality of life of some patients increased within short period of time, like in this case, two months. So in, in our um, observation, it's significant. So we mm -hmm. consider it's a very good improvement, uh, what we actually could uh, expect or imagine. So I, on this note, I'd like to thank you all and ready for discussion and the questions. You, My ba battery is on now, so yeah, let's. <laughs> and, Thank and, you so much. And, and I had to rejoin. I had to rejoin on my phone because somehow my power just disappeared. See? I knew we collaborating on different levels. <laughs> on, on a very different level, Damir. Unbelievable. <laughs> Damir, do you want to stop sharing so that we can oh, yes. see each other? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Marvin, you had a comment already on the, the Parkinson and uh, uh, Alzheimer's dementia cases. Uh, yeah, it's just that well, it, Demir picked up on it. It was basically that the subjects who were duly diagnosed from the movement disorders clinic at Baylor, Scott and White, who were included in the study, they had Alzheimer's, they had dementia and Parkinson's and the family members reported significant improvements not only in the Parkinson's symptoms, in the dementia, but also in the Parkinson's symptoms. That was all. Very cool. Regarding this, I also wanted to add before you uh, give me uh, any questions. So um, Parkinson's patients actually improved. We had few um, on our dementia list uh, which, with Parkinson's disease. And uh, some tremors actually uh, improved over time. So uh, mm -hmm. some... Um, uh, you know, clock drawing tests improved so that the little motor uh, uh, function was improved as well. So it was noticeable uh, without any special readings. So, and that were noted by family members as well. I see Han Lee. Hello, Damir. Nice talk. How are How you, Dr. Lee? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Uh, very impressive for some of the new results that I haven't seen. So, if you can go, or maybe you, you remember what I mean, just one page before your summary about that MRI images. Yes. So how did you do that measurement? I mean, it's going to be very um, supporting if you have done certain uh, rigorous study with um, brain imaging. So can you explain a little more for that oh, case? Yes. 
Yes, so this is actually a very good question. I really appreciate you ask this. I, let me just very quickly uh, demonstrate what uh, Dr. Liu is asking. So that was about this slide here, right? Yeah. So uh, this is a, e, a quantitative EEG imaging uh, that was done also in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Berman. So he has a wonderful person which is in Colorado um, uh, currently. And okay. he's a great neuropsychologist who actually had access to the software and actually could do some analysis readings for us of this nature. So yeah. Hanley, the, these, are, these are MRI looking uh, adaptations of the quantitative EEG data. It is quantitative EEG. However, quantitative EEG is just uh, using EEG to project the signals onto right. the brain map, but then in order to localize the actual places, and also I think one of them is showing sort of a connectivity. How did he do that? Meaning basically you have this to have some kind of uh, co-registration. I mean, again, I'm just wondering, did people do the mesh or the, is this from patients or from healthy? Patients. These are from, these are from patients. Hanley, this, this is, um, this is, this is using the in, interpolation data using SW Loretta analysis so that we can interpolate from the surface measurements of EEG recording we can then interpolate the current source density location in the specific Broadman areas down to about, uh, I think, three millimeters. Uh, and we can identify, therefore, the Broadman areas. But we can also infer the using DTI uh, approximation, we can show the tract association, but not the specific actual DTI tracking. So it looks like yes. a DTI measurement, but it's really okay, too great. So I can, I guess, talk to you more, but is it? Absolutely, absolutely. This is what we're doing with the current, our current research is using this level of analysis. Now. Maybe maybe related to, for, for, for the group here, what's the meaning of red color? Is that between both? To it's above uh, above but, normal. But, but is this measurement for comparison between post treatment and pre treatment? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And so it was three standard deviations so, above the mean. Again, remember we're using normative are, are analysis. Are plans so. to do direct DTI yeah. tractography studies as opposed to interpolating EEG to DTI? This is one, of, I, I mean, I don't mean to be glib, but it really starts out with how much money do you have? It's really, yes, the, the, the intent is to do that. The funding for that is uh, currently, you know, we're, we're, we're seeking that level of support and I hope we find it. And it's maybe harder really to put those patients, depending on the level of AD, it's hard to put them into the magnet. Right. So we need somebody in the earlier stages. And maybe, as we've been discussing, it may be that this is an MCI level study. Yeah, so, that's, that's great if you have that kind of data. Yeah. So uh, for the group, um, I'm working with the NFL Alumni Association. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, it makes sense, Marvin, to put you directly and also Dimitri to put you directly in touch uh, with the group I'm working with. That would, that, be would be, yes. that would be terrific. And I mean, that. yeah. And Jason, uh, Demir and I are, work closely with uh, Professor Jason Wang, who's the chairman of neurosurgery at Baylor Scott and White. And he's a very well regarded uh, researcher and DOD and it NIH. Is senior reviewer, so I think publications, which is yes. yeah. Can you can you send yes. me a, an email with all three of you so I can introduce you to uh, the NFL? Absolutely. Thanks, Jay. That was, uh, yeah, speaking of where there might be some funding. Right. On the front. So point, Marvin. I have a, a, <laughs> Not wasting time. Yes, come on, Marvin. Where's the email already? <laughs> um, I, I, I have a quick oh. follow-up question on, on that image. Uh, um, so, um, so you talk about uh, uh, three standard deviation above normal. 
Is that a measure of the increase in, in connectivity um, through QEG as a result of treatment? Uh, is that what you're referring? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and that, that's really remarkable. Um, and were there any particular uh, network uh, that you saw were strengthened? Thank you, Paolo. I'm, I'm actually putting that data together and um, Dr. Williams, who's also on the schedule, uh, uh, Kristen Williams. Okay, good. She's, go she's gonna be, it's, it's kind of funny how you should mention that. Dr. Williams is gonna be presenting the network. Fantastic. So that'll be in a couple of months. Sounds good. Um, can't wait. Um, I, I wanted also to say that I don't see you all, so uh, feel free to speak up if you have questions. I don't see you all in my Dr. screen. Dr. Uh, Lisa Weil just commented in the chat, uh, we are also working with retired athletes. Would, the, would it be interest in a moot site study? Sounds like a great idea. Yes, because a lot of these athletes are obviously in different areas. Yes, uh, they will be open for uh, discussion and uh, open to any, uh, you know, a collaborative work. Well, the, the, the good news is that many of these uh, potential players actually are in Texas. So you're, you're at Baylor, the main campus at Baylor? Yes, uh, Baylor, Baylor uh, Health. Yes, it's in Temple, Texas, main campus. So it's former Scotland White Hospital. Okay. Um, huge coverage. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, as far as process goes, uh, yeah, Marvin, if you don't mind, just send me an email with uh, Demir's and Jason's information, and I'll yes, I'll, yes, I'll pass it on today to get some. When uh, when we hang when we hang up, let yeah, let's have this discussion, which is fantastic. Yeah, good work um, by the way. Really, very very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad that this is working also in terms of group connectivity in between us. Um, I also wanted to mention, I was curious about how you came up with the twice a day uh, regimen. So, you know, it's interesting because even in our clinic, we have patients that, that have difficulties coming twice or three times a week, and we Excellent. are uh, suggesting the twice a day. Um, yeah. So I wondered about that. And well, also the mm -hmm. sleep piece uh, if you have any more details on what you've yes. noticed on sleep we'll be happy to so first of all the twice a day uh regimen it's a very good question so we were not sh for sure uh, uh where to start so of course we know the uh previous photobiomodulation near infrared light um uh, reports and uh, that uh, shows incredible, remarkable safety features in in terms of uh, it's not, you really very hard to overdose the uh, you know the light, so uh, so that's why twice a day because this device was given uh, to um, you know uh, patients home, so and it was done at home, so that's why basically uh, the patient could go even over than two twice a day. So twice a day it was. Firstly, designed for the pilot study uh, to just, uh, you know, have a safety approach uh, uh, to it. So we want to make sure that it's safe and the sound to use uh, with the patient. And uh, so th that's treatment uh, twice a day was uh, in six minutes time points actually were based on some data, uh, 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 based on the uh, animal models where we could see improvement, where the longer than six minutes with this uh, wavelength did not show any improvement as far as the uh, behavioral improvements. So that's why uh, sticking to six minutes as a minimal uh, best uh, probably was our the, uh, choice to go. And that's where we stop uh, uh, as, as a first pilot study. After we start to see and observe findings and improvements in patients, we just stick to this protocol without uh, changing much. But I'm sure I uh, personally believe that uh, using it three times a day, six minutes won't hurt patients, especially with the, you know, more severe and moderate dementia. So because it's uh, very difficult to do any harm with, the, with the this light. I see a last minute question from David. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Demir. Very, very encouraging results. Um, following Paulo's question, so how how do you measure the, the the kind of times and duration they use the machine since they are they already have some sort of dementia um, or or a certain degree of cognitive impairment? 
how do you how do you measure the time do you measure the oh, it's automated here? yeah it's uh, are you referring to the helmet device the time how we measure exactly, the treatment exactly. it's automated it shuts down at six minutes time point so that's uh, one of the safety features to be incorporated in the device so right. that, and they do they do they do remember to do this twice a day or some of them just can't so this is a very important question yes so in order to you know perform and make it adequate throughout the all subjects in the trial Yes, first of all, we make sure that the family members always nearby uh, to implement the study. We also have a log involved, so where they sign in every time they actually do uh, study performance. So, but these days, uh, new technology for the next generation device, we will implement a so number of, so it will be linked to the application where we will be able to see all ins and outs. So, and uh, how often patients use it during a day. So this, everything will be automated and actually uh, link sync to the network where we will be able to see readings. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we, we came to the hour. Thank you so much, uh, Damir. This was really, again, a very interesting and stimulating uh, and uh, looking forward to many more of these sessions. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is a great group. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm really pleased to be part of this talk. And uh, uh, please uh, keep me on. I would like to, uh, you know, uh, still be participating and uh, involved in your discussion. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Demir. Bye. You'll be in Bye. touch. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.